Today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show, we're going to look at the Vault 5e Crafting and Alchemy books by Cubicle 7, available on Kickstarter. We're going to talk about making lore optional, an excellent blog article I read. I'm going to highlight three really killer YouTube videos that came out this past week from Bob Worldbelder and Kelsey Dion and Baron Derop and Tegan J. Uh, all on YouTube with links and a little bit of discussion of that. Our big topic today is going to be tips that we can pick up for our tabletop role-playing game from Baldur's Gate 3. Now that I've run a lot of Baldur's Gate 3, what are some tips that I can offer that I have kind of come to me from playing Baldur's Gate 3? And we're going to cover more questions from the January 2024 Patreon q and I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things in tabletop role-playing games. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to all kinds of awesome features. The City of Arches Sourcebook, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, a dedicated Discord server the monthly q a whole bunch of tools to help you run your games you get tons and tons of stuff for a very low price for becoming a patron of sly flourish and patrons help me put on shows like this patrons thank you so much cubicle seven has been doing a lot of really interesting books i have brought up multiple times how much i like uncharted journeys which is a big thick book covering how to do travel it was one of my favorite books of last year for 5e i i, I recommend it very much they have a new one called a life well lived that was a kickstarter they had done a while ago that's been progressing well and i've heard people who have been reading the the, the early drafts of that say that it's really outstanding and they have a new kickstarter right now for crafting and alchemy it's actually going to be two separate books that are available on this on this kickstarter hammer and anvil and mortar and pest and mortar and pestle hammer and anvil is about making weapons and armor and other kinds of weaponsmith and stuff like that and the mortar and pestle is about alchemy and potion brewing and other such things like that so two whole systems for handling that i really like i don't know who at cubicle seven is making the decisions about what kind of products they put out and i will say that neither of these subjects are completely unique that both of them there have been a fair number of products that have come out about building magic items or systems for building magic items and systems for handling alchemy and brewing and stuff like that. And some of them are very good. So it is not a untouched area, but I do like how cubicle seven is essentially aiming for areas to expand fifth edition that go beyond what we typically find with things like monster books and setting source books and things like that, that they're really aiming for a wide range of different things. And I think that they are running these experiments with them. One, so there isn't, there isn't sadly, there aren't samples. I always like to see a sample of what I would be getting. And there are, there are pictures and things like that. I would really love to have a few pages just to get an idea of the kinds of things that, that I would have here. But I have seen the other work that Cubicle 7 does. I know we, we know that they can produce. We know that they make books. It's a little interesting that Hammer and Anvil and Mortar and Pestle, that this, that this Kickstarter is coming out before uh, they have fulfilled the other one. But we've seen a lot of progress on the Life Well Lived Kickstarter. Uh, I did back the PDF versions of these. Uh, I, w- I want to kind of see them in digital before I'm like unwilling to commit to having space on my on my tables for them. And I have other books that are like these that I'm also not using. So the big question of like whether or not whether or not I would I, these are areas that I want to dive deep into. But if you're interested in high quality 5e material with excellent art, excellent design from from Kickstarter, check out Cubicle Sevens Crafting in Alchemy Vault 5e Crafting in Alchemy books available on Kickstarter now. You can find a link to this Kickstarter in the show notes i read a really awesome article called make your lore optional by phd20 it's at the blog phg20.com once again you can find a link to this article in the notes and this hit on a really interesting idea for me really interesting thought and he brings up in the article the elder scrolls in skyrim and how you can find little bits of lore all throughout that game either examining scrolls and stuff like that finding elements on the walls and anybody who's been playing like fantasy role-playing games knows about this kind of lore i'm going to be talking a lot about baldur's gate 3 in a little bit and in the baldur's gate 3 game they do it primarily primarily through like scrolls and notes and books and they're all pretty quick to read like they're all small text you can kind of open it up and you can read the book and sort of learn a thing i think in baldur's gate 3 it's like it's there's such rich lore for the forgotten realms and the sword coast and all the gods and all the stuff that's going on that those books can really help you out and they're also small enough to digest that you can read them pretty quickly that said like i skip a lot of the books because i'm like i don't i'm busy i'm in the middle of stuff i don't want to read a book about the gods right now i got 
cultists that are about to attack me. And that's the kind of premise behind this article, which is that not all of your lore needs to be mandatory, that you don't want to drop your lore in and force people to read it. Again, like you're, you can play Baldur's Gate 3 just fine and not read all of those books. You'll, you'll pick up what you need to pick up in order to get the quest. You'll understand more about what's going on. There's some really interesting like character-based things about like relationships be- between characters that you wouldn't pick up. Baldur's Gate definitely has the like, you kill a, you know, you kill a dude and they have a note to, you know, a guy has a note to his mom on him and now you feel bad because you're like, oh, or like, you know, two cultists that are one cultist that's in love with another cultist writing a love letter to them. Or yesterday I saw one where it's like, you read one thing that was the tally sheet for who's been winning this dice game that they've been playing and one guy has been dominating and then when you kill that guy you look and he's got a book about how to cheat at dice games on him really fun connections like that that you can pick up that you miss if you don't look at that stuff however it's not mandatory so what do you do one thing i love about this article is it's short look how short his article is like i can read that in an email he has an email newsletter by the way if you go to dot com and you you click on it there is a nice you can subscribe right here to subscribe to his newsletter and i immediately did because it was really cool and he knows how to write in in brief he knows how to keep things focused so how do we create optional lore in our ttrpg because it's kind of different we don't sort of drop a ton of material in our game and the players are just like throwing in a bag and ignoring it uh instead like we are having this direct connection with our players all the time so we can kind of tell when lore is sticky or when it's not and it's a different way of thinking about how to make lore optional in our ttrpg than it is if we were writing a game or even writing a supplement for a ttrpg for example and that's in how we push it now I, of course, always go back to Secrets and Clues because it's it's my thing and I think it really works. And I'm always like, oh, yeah, that's like Secrets and Clues. And I'm and, you know, I'm probably stuck in my little rut on that. But I feel like that's a good way to test out lore that I'm not on top of every, all of the other advantages of Secrets and Clues, where you can sort of, you know, have 10 pieces of information the characters might discover about any aspect of the game, whether it's lore, whether it's history, whether it's character plot or npc plots or other things that are going on and you write those 10 things down and you don't attribute them to anything in particular which means you can drop them in when they make sense one of the other features of those is a great way to test lore which lore are the characters grabbing onto which are they remembering what are they picking up and because you're only dropping these these tiny bite-sized nuggets you're not saying like oh i wrote four pages of text you know there's the the tome of strahd in the original i6 ravenloft is like four pages long and no one reads it everyone's like oh my god four pages who's gonna read four pages of stuff so you could kind of like throw it on the table and like maybe somebody picks it up and maybe somebody kind of skim reads it and picks up some interesting things and say, hey, I was just, while I was waiting for my combat round, I was reading this Thomas Stroud and it turns out that Sergey and, you know, Sergey and whatever his name is, or they're, they're really, you know, they have a problem. They got family problems. So a way to test that out of these, like keep it to one sentence and then kind of evoke that sentence, you know, bring it up when it makes sense and then see if the players resonate with it. And over the course of a campaign, you'll start to see what elements of lore resonate with with them. And you can steer the lore that you're creating around the areas that are particularly interesting to them, either because it's connected to their character or the character's background or the player is just really into it. You know, all of those kinds of things that you can sort of grab on and go with that we can do in our TTRPGs that we can't do in computer games because the computer doesn't know which lore I'm interested in. It can't really figure out that I like one thing over another. So, but we DMs can there's a really interesting story too. I read it a long time ago and I don't think I could find the article for it, but it was about Valve and how they were testing the lore of Portal 2. That Portal 2 had this kind of big overarching story, but they wanted to make sure that the story was something that the players were able to pick up. And what they did is they kept testing it over and over again. They would they would do this during play testing. They would they would have people play the game for a while. They'd have stuff go on, and then they'd stop and kind of ask them, "Why do you think that this is going on?" or "What do you think the connection is between this person and this person?" And they would answer. And what they kept recognizing was that they were putting out way more lore than the players were actually picking up on. And this got gets into my whole idea that players are only picking up half of what you're throwing out there. So in that same way, we can test things. We can ask them. This is one of the benefits of asking 
getting the players to summarize the game is that the stuff they summarize is the stuff that they remembered. And now you're hearing it from them. And then you know, what do I need to reinforce? What can I safely throw away? What didn't matter? You know, what's a misconception that they picked up on? There's lots of different ways that we can sort of get that feedback. So one of the neat things that we can do with our tabletop role-playing games that's different than what computer games do as far as making lore optional is we can be in this constant feedback loop of handing out small pieces of lore through things like secrets and clues, asking them at the beginning of the game to kind of summarize what happened, watching what resonates, steering, and then coming up with new secrets as we go. It means that sometimes we will take entire lines of lore and throw it away because nobody cares. It means that some bits of lore we're going to reinforce over and over again because we want to make sure they really got it. It gives us lots of, I guess that's not really optional if you're doing that, but it gives us lots of opportunity to test and continually test the lore of our game to see what's resonating with the players. So I thought this was a really fantastic article, Making lore, your, making Your Lore Optional by PhD20. You can find a link to the original article in the show notes. Really, really neat idea and one that was I found very thought-provoking. I want to highlight three YouTube videos that I watched this past week that I really loved. I thought they were really excellent videos and I thought it was worth highlighting some of them. In some cases, I don't think they need much of highlighting from me, uh, but I still want to uh, bring attention to them because I think they were just such outstanding examples of the kinds of videos that really make the TTRPG community better. The first one is Bob World Builder. On, he did a uh, video on 15 RPGs that he played in 2023 with descriptions of these different RPGs, including the 5e Basic Rules, Shadow Dark, Dungeon Crawl Classics, X Crawl Classics, Index Card Role Playing, Deathbringer RPG, DC, DC 20, Dagger Heart, Cairn, Easy D6, Skate Wizards, Goons and Ghosts, Candle Obscura, Avatar Legends, and the Cypher System. Really, I mean, that's, you know, I'm spoiling, but it's in his notes, so it's not that big of a spoiler. But it's such an outstanding video that talks about all of these games, what makes them interesting, what makes them unique. And and I think that when it comes to just seeing how wide the TTRPG industry is and the, and the, the hobby is and all of these different kind of RPGs, it really is good. And it made me go and, and look at like RPGs that I haven't looked at in a while that I have and maybe go look at other ones and go, man, I maybe want to pick that one up or I definitely want to try it. Boy, I would sure love to try as many RPGs as he tried in this past year. I have only tried like two or three. He did 15 different RPGs. Really, really outstanding video and I highly recommend it. I love... Bob World Builder's channel is maybe, I don't know if it is my favorite. It's really good. It's a really, really awesome YouTube show. He's such a positive guy. He clearly loves this industry so much. He works really, really hard on his videos and it really shows. It's out, outstanding. So check out Bob World Builder and check out Top 15 RPGs that can save you time. Do they, the top, I tried 15 RPGs. Oh, he tried 15 RPGs to save us the time of playing them all. On the other hand, it made me want to play them all. So it didn't really save me time. Thanks for that, Bob. Now I got to play 15 RPGs. Really good video though. The next one, uh, Kelsey Dion and Baron DeRop of their perspective YouTube channels had an awesome hour and 51 minute talk deconstructing and rebuilding RPG design, but in talking in particular about what went behind the design and the construction of the Shadow Dark RPG. It is a really, really outstanding conversation. Two really awesome people, very, very smart people talking about the construction of Shadow Dark RPG and what it meant. Again, a very positive conversation, not bashing anything, recognizing Recognizing the, the the recognizing what the community is, I'm, I haven't even finished it yet. I'm an hour I'm an hour into it, but in that hour, I've learned so much about Shadow Dark, but a lot a lot about TTRPG design in general, particularly like the the balance and the thought about old school games. Really, really good video, and I highly recommend it. I I I've, I've been listening to it in like 15 20 minute chunks here and there while doing other things, and I really enjoyed it. So check out deconstructing and rebuilding RPG design on it's it's hosted on the Dungeon Masterpiece. YouTube channel, Baron de Rupp's channel, and involves Baron de Rupp and Kelsey Dion, the creator of Shadow Dark RPG, talking about their designs. Really, really awesome video. And the third video I saw yesterday, this was recommended on the Sly Flourish Discord server, which you can get by becoming a patron of Sly Flourish. And that was Tegan J of Tegan J Gaming, who has a video called A Defense of Dungeons and Dragons, D&D &D 5e. And it's such a positive take 
So Tegan on his on, on their channel shows a whole bunch of videos on a whole bunch of different kinds of systems. They've recently been talking about 13th Age, doing a lot of 13th Age. I love 13th Age. It's one of my favorite RPGs. So it's really cool to see the wide variety of different RPGs that, that Tegan is talking about. But in particular, this video is really good because it, you know, in a in a time, and I I I get a, I get accused of bashing. I don't bash Dungeons and Dragons. I certainly hold feet to the fire with Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast. And obviously, there's been a lot of negativity towards Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast, and a lot of negativity towards D and D. And this is a great video that talks about like what it, has it done. Now, it focuses primarily on the role that Wizards of the Coast and D and D has had in the TTRPG industry, uh, the, the TTRPG uh, hobby overall over the past year or so, more so than even the design of Five E. I think there's a lot to say about the design of 5e and why it has worked so well and why it has been so sticky and what elements to it have made it such a good primer for people to start playing TTRPGs. I, I don't necessarily think you could say it is the design of the RPG itself that made it as popular as it is. I don't think that's accurate, but it is an excellent catalyst for D&D because it is good enough that the people who found out or became interested in D&D again were able to pick it up and play it and run it and made the whole industry like five times bigger than it was in the past seven or eight years. And uh, so this video in particular, really excellent video, talks about what benefit that has had, just the growth of D&D and 5e, and the benefit that that has had for the TTRPG community overall. And I know it's really easy to like worry about stuff and talk about how we feel about the 2024 books or you know, get into all the various controversies that occurred over the past year. But it's something else to remember that like the whole industry is so much bigger. The whole hobby is so much bigger than it has ever been. And so many new people are in, in the hobby. So many more people have learned to play TTRPGs in the last two years than in the last 50. And that is incredible. It's incredible to think about that. And all of these people are into the hobby now. And what I think is really interesting is that means all of those people will have always been part of the hobby. Maybe they step away and get involved in other things. Maybe they move off, but maybe they stay and maybe they step away and then come back. These, all of these people now have experience with TTRPGs and that's kind of permanent right? That doesn't go away. When we talk about things rising and falling, when you've had that many people get into the hobby because of the success of, of Dungeons and Dragons and 5e over the past 10 years, all of those people will always have been players. And that means that part of the growth, like I was thinking about it, I talked about this in this Discord server, like, are we going to see a new OSR 20 years from now that's based on 5e? Because so many people will have started with 5e that that is the first version of D&D that they ever saw. And is that the one that's going to be nostalgic for them? I think that nostalgia might hit us sooner. So it's going to be really interesting. But I just, I, I love this video. I love the positive take. I love that it really shows just how big and, and, and how much wider our hobby has gotten over the years. So really outstanding video. You can check that out. That was Tegan J from the Tegan, Tegan J Gaming Channel. Subscribe to his channel and check out everything they got. Really good video. So I just, those are three videos that really grabbed me and that I really dug. Patrons of Sly Flourish get access to all kinds of cool things. I like to show off different things or show off how they evolved. One thing I'm going to only briefly mention it now, and I'll probably do a longer run, is I just posted, and this is no, only the people in the Sly Flourish Discord server knows this, but I'm probably going to be sending out a Patreon update that the City of Arches sourcebook has had a major revision, and that new revision is available to patrons of Sly Flourish. If you go, if you're a patron and you go to your rewards page and you download the latest version of the City of Arches, you'll get it. It's a hundred. 125 pages long now it's huge i went for a full top to bottom it took me a full month uh, to do a top to bottom read through cleaning up lots of text cleaning up lots of connections between different groups deconflicting things that had conflict revising tons of stuff and adding a whole bunch random encounter tables for every one of the biomes for example uh, a brand new nameless king uh, stat block, a stat block for the Nameless King, the main antagonist. Lots of things that are going to be available on that. So you can check that out. It's really, really good. But I wanted to show another thing. I've shown it uh, from time to time in the past. I want to show it again, which is the Dwarven Forge VTT virtual tabletop backgrounds. So this is an idea that I, I had started probably a year or so ago, and I've been adding new 
new entries to this as we go. It's uh, again, as a patron of Sly Flourish, you can find this on your Patreon rewards page. There's a Dwarven Forge VTT backdrop link. You click that, it takes you to a photo album that has transparent PNGs of backgrounds of setups that I have built in Dwarven Forge that you can use as virtual tabletop, isometric virtual tabletop backgrounds in your VTT of choice. The best way to use these, I find, is to remove the grid from your, you know, remove grid and remove grid snapping, and that way tokens can kind of freely move around them. And even though they're isometric, they still look really well. This is an example of one. I haven't even used this in my game yet i made this one and haven't used it in my game so what i do is whenever i build a dwarven forge setup not every time but almost every time that i build a dwarven forge setup for my home game i put a white background behind it i put it up i take a picture with my phone i can use space age technology to turn it into a transparent image and then i post it to this so i'm usually posting like you know a couple times a month new updates could get put in here's like a an underground well i know it's got a white background the white background actually disappears when you use the 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 transparent png version I think it does. I don't know why that one it doesn't look transparent. Here's a crazy like old ruin. Oh, these are all ones from Star Song Tower. So if you've played the Star Song Tower free adventure from Ruins of the Grendel Root, I have a whole series of Dwarven Forge backdrops specifically designed to run with Star Song Tower. So I thought that was kind of neat. You know, this, I ran this for a bunch of new players and it was really neat. So there's a whole bunch of these virtual tabletop backgrounds, all different kinds of things that you can see, you know, bridges over strange chasms. This is like a sacrificial, little sacrificial bridge, you know, all kinds of, here's some, some big overland places, like a a great big overland area with old ruins, creepy, creepy altars, lots of stuff that you can use. So a fun way to get some of the joy of Dwarven Forge without having to actually buy all the Dwarven Forge and can use them virtually in your game. Dwarven Forge, the, the fine folks of Dwarven Forge gave me permission to be able to do this kind of thing. They said it was something that they would love to do, but never had the time. So kind of a, a, a neat way. These are all ones that I've used for my Empire of the Ghouls campaign. Neat way to get some additional additional use for your virtual tabletops. Baldur's Gate 3. Baldur's Gate 3 has taken the video game world by storm and thus Dungeons and Dragons has taken the video game world by storm. And I have to say not, I don't think ever have I played a video game that better captured the fun of Dungeons and Dragons for me. I have played Dungeons and Dragons video games back to the uh, Pool of Radiance gold box game made by, made by SSI back in the 80s. That was actually the first time I touched D&D was through that video game. And I have to wonder how many new people are going to just learn about D&D from Baldur's Gate 3 and then realize that that is the kind of game that they can play at the game table as well. I hope a lot because it was an outstanding game. It's, it was game of the year. It was game of the year by far. Like, I don't know anybody who said, oh, no, that's not the game of the year. This other game. They're like, no, Baldur's Gate 3 is going to win game of the year. And it really did. They spent a long time making this game. I have now played through Baldur's Gate 3 twice. I'm right at the end of my second playthrough. I've learned a whole lot about the game and I have a lot of tips that I think are valuable tips that we can keep in mind for our tabletop role playing game. Now, of course, you may have other tips that you think matter a lot more. Please feel free to email me or send me, uh, put a comment up talking about what things you learned from Baldur's Gate 3 that you feel like you you or others could bring to your tabletop game. But I sat down and thought, what are some elements to Baldur's Gate 3 that I think teach me something about tabletop role-playing games? And so we're going to talk about those right now. An interesting one is the default to DC-10. Many times throughout Baldur's Gate 3, you will come to various areas in you know, disarming traps or opening doors or opening chests or everything like that. And you'll find common DC 10. It doesn't matter how powerful your characters are. It doesn't matter which character is doing it. You'll see a default to DC 10. Mike Merles, who just recently started up a Patreon, talked about this, talked about the idea that DC 10 should become the medium DC for 5e. And he has some good arguments, good arguments for this case that you can that, that if you consider characters proficient, you want them to succeed about two thirds of the time. And to do that, that means DC 10 should probably become the default. And you can see this in Baldur's Gate 3, where you can definitely see how often 
DC 10 is used throughout the entire game. And that leads to the other one, which is you can see where DCs don't scale with the characters. That as the characters get more powerful, it's not like everything else in the world has their DCs changing. You will find DC 10 checks all the way to the very end of the game. You'll also find some DC 25, some DC 30, some DC 99s. There's at least one DC 99, which is kind of ridiculous. I don't know why they bother with a DC 99, particularly because there's one where you're like rolling a whole series of checks that keep getting worse and worse and you're burning all your inspiration on them. And then you realize, I guess I was not ever going to succeed anyway. So why'd you do that to me? But you'll notice that the DCs don't scale. They, they scale with the challenge. They scale with the level of the difficulty of the thing you're trying to do, not with the fact that you might have, you know, Asteron with a crazy high trap trap thing. So that is definitely something I learned. So one thing that I'm going to add here is don't, you don't have to have them roll all the time and, and don't have them roll like over and over again. So I had an area recently and this happens in Baldur's Gate 3 in a few areas where you walk in and the places are super heavily trapped and you have to disarm like 12 traps in a row, but you have a guy that's like plus 12 on trap detect. And or plus 12 on, on disarmed traps and the traps all have DCs of 10 and you're like, I'm only going to fail on a one. Are you really going to make me roll over and over and over again until I roll a one just to see if I, I set something off? And by the way, I also have four inspiration points, which I can use at any time, which means I'm not, if even if I roll one, I'm going to roll again, which means the odds are so that why are you even bothering to having me roll now this is one area where we have an advantage as a tabletop rpg gm we can tell when it's getting boring and we can say with your tremendous skill you're able to successfully disarm all of the traps in this room right and you just say it and it's done you know you go through you cut all the lines you fix all the tiles you disarm all of the poison spray things Instead of having you constantly roll for checks, you can just say that they do it. And that's something that I wish Baldur's Gate 3 had, sort of a passive, you know, a passive disarm check that, you know, could even have a little message that says, Asteron successfully disarms this, a trap, right? Like, just do it because you know we're going to do it. Do it in the background instead of constantly requiring rolls. Guidance cheese is okay. For 10 years, I've had GMs talk about how guidance should work or that guidance doesn't work or constantly, you know, clerics constantly spamming guidance is a problem. It's fine. Let them use guidance. It's okay. Let them know that they can use guidance. It's only an extra D4. It lets multiple players get involved in a situation. There's lots of times where guidance, the, the, the way that guidance works is just fine and fun. And you can see it in Baldur's Gate 3. They allow you to use guidance everywhere. They even have an amulet that has guidance as a, as a cantrip on it so that you could just have any player add guidance whenever, as long as they're wearing that amulet, which is really powerful. It's a really big advantage. You're basically getting like an average of plus two on every roll that you would, any skill check that you would make, regardless of who makes it. So that's really advantageous. But it's fine. Like, don't feel like guidance is overpowered. You can actually see how they work it and recognize that it's in there. So one way you can actually speed up your game, similar to the way that Baldur's Gate 3 does it, is you stack up all of your defenses and you just sort of add them when you know they're going to be added. So if a character is going to use the help action with another character, you can say, would anybody like to roll an Arcana check? Or anybody can roll an Arcana check that's trained in Arcana. And anyone else who is also trained in Arcana can aid them. And, and if you want to throw guidance, you can throw guidance on there too. And then just go straight to the roll. So you can skip all of this kind of conversation and get right down to what they're going to do. And that works. And that works just fine. So guidance cheese is fine. Character optimization is totally fine. As long as you're playing a video game. I have said now a couple of times, I've, I've, been, I've been power gaming my way through my second playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3, and I've been trying a bunch of different builds. My main character is a monk, and I've been totally like adding more and more damage to his unarmed strikes until now he does an average of 33 damage per punch, and he can do four punches around, and then if he's hastened, he can do six. And I'm just destroying stuff. I'm just walking around and punching and destroying everything, and it's really fun. And I would totally kick myself out of any gaming group if I was to do that at my own actual tabletop game. So character optimization is really, really fun when you're playing a video game where there isn't a GM on the other side. It also can make the game pretty boring. The one advantage that I've had is I would respec characters. I would try a broken build for a while, see it do its awesome stuff, and then respec into a different one. So I have another character who I turned into a sharpshooting bowmaster guy, fighter, fighter, champion, archer, sharpshooter. And he also does like 
25 damage a shot on the average and can fire six times around with action surge or nine times around on a haste and an action surge so that's tremendously powerful right he's just pouring arrows out and his thing is he could do it from anywhere so he could just shoot people pop, 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 and he's just destroying people really fun and then i'm like okay that was fun i'm gonna put that guy away and i'm gonna take out my other character who's optimized around great weapon master and she's gonna charge up and smash stuff with her sword and that's been really fun Character op is totally cool in a video game. In fact, my hope is that people who are really interested in the character optimization features of D&D do that in the video game and don't do it at the home game because character optimization can be really, really boring for people and for other players and for the GM at a home game. So maybe keep your character optimization stuff uh, to video games and focus on the story and the character in your, in your home games. Character driven stories really matter you can see the arcs that all of the npcs have all of your main characters have in baldur's gate 3 you can watch the arcs that they have it behooves us to keep tracks of these kinds of arcs for the characters in our in our ttrpgs what are the arcs that they've got what are sort of the ways that they've changed over time how do we know ask them campfire stories tell us about where you've come from where you've been where you think you're going you know, tell about what your hopes and dreams are for the future. What are your character's goals? What kind of new mechanical options are you excited about? Again, the character optimization. Ask them. Think about their character arc. Think about things you can drop in that, pr- that promote their character their their character if there are interesting sub quests or sub dungeons that can focus on a character that could be a really fun way to spotlight one particular character for one part of the game don't make them huge make sure that they're interesting enough to everybody else that they're worth going through but you can still have them kind of arc around one particular character that sort of thing is really fun Baldur's gate 3 does a great job with this and that's something we can definitely pick up on and do in our own game here's a good tip lots of monsters are far more dangerous than great big single monsters all throughout Baldur's Gate 3, in any time you face a really challenging battle, they're riddled with dudes. They have lots and lots and lots of dudes. Sometimes too many, too many dudes. Sometimes you're fighting too many guys at once. But every boss always has other monsters with it. Sometimes you'll fight a really powerful boss that animates other people around it so that you always have to worry about these other things. Almost every battle of consequence is against multiple creatures. Even when you're facing really big ones, the big ones have multiple creatures. If you play Baldur's Gate 3, you know that this is the case all the way to the very end where you have like nine dudes casting magic missile on you all the time. So this is a really good tip for strong boss fights. We talk about this in Forge of Foes. It's a really good tip to pick up on. Particularly, you don't have to worry about it really until you start to go to like fifth level and above in fifth edition D&D. But lots of monsters are way more dangerous than a single monster action economy matters focus matters single creatures are just at a significant disadvantage compared to multiple creatures in many ways not just action economy but in many ways just attention the att- the focus of attention is different when you have lots of lots of creatures so if you want to make a challenging fight add more monsters likewise You'll notice that many of the boss monsters in Baldur's Gate 3 have tons of hit points. There was one particular monster that I fought early on in the Underdark. A very, I'm not going to say any Baldur's Gate 3 spoilers, but a, 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 a very notable monster. A very notable monster that you face in the Underdark. And... I looked at it and I was like, holy cow, that thing has a ton of hit points. And I was like, let me get my monster manual out. And I looked at the monster manual and I was like, it doesn't have nearly that many hit points in the monster manual. The developers of Baldur's Gate 3 recognize that, that particularly for big single monsters, that they need tons of hit points. And it's like, I fought a creature that had 666 hit points at level 11 or 12. I saw big monsters that had 400 hit points. I saw creatures with 200, 200 hit points as early as fifth level. So definitely some creatures, more hit points are often needed for a creature to be able to survive, particularly with a well-optimized group that really knows what they're doing. Hit points are still key. Now, of course, in a TTRPG, we can tune this as we go. We can change things on the on, behind the scenes. So you can decide, like, is this battle getting boring? Well, let's cut those hit points down. And that way you don't have a battle that takes too long. But likewise, if you feel like a boss is going to be getting a lot of attention, you might want to give them some more hit points because hit points really matter. Terrain features. One of the things about the tactical combat nature of Baldur's Gate 3 is it really shows you what a tactical D&D game can look like. And terrain can be really, really a strong way to challenge characters. 
It could also be a real slog. It can be really annoying too. And it's a careful balance between an interesting layout that challenges the characters and one that's just a boring slog. It's a really, really thin line. And while it's kind of neat to have sort of archers up in the rafters shooting down on characters below, if the players don't have ways to deal with that and they have to spend 12 rounds finding a ladder to go climb up there to go punch the dude, that could be annoying. And one interesting thing between two playthroughs of Baldur's Gate 3 was that I focused a lot on mobility in my second playthrough. I picked characters that had long strider that could be castable as a ritual so that all my characters had extra movement, like like 50% extra movement for the whole game because it's so much nicer to be able to run up and get to things. And does it remove some of the challenge? Yeah, but boy, it just speeds things up and it makes things easier. Every character of mine has some way to either gate or misty step or dimension door so that I can get to those rituals rafters and get up there and shove people down lots of different ways to, to get mobility when i didn't have that mobility it was really tedious running around a lot so keep that in mind if you're building environments make sure you build environments that don't just challenge the characters but also give advantages to the characters at different times. Give them the opportunity to go up in the rafters and shoot down on the bad guys. Give them the chance to use elements of terrain to, to their advantage, which does happen in Baldur's Gate 3. But you really want to think about that. And, and be careful of using terrain as a real slog. This is something we've talked about in a lot of different books. I've talked about in Forge of Foes. I, you know, that you, you want to make sure that terrain is exciting and interesting and challenging and not boring and not tedious. So something to be careful of and something that you can see a lot in Baldur's Gate 3. Spells on magic items are awesome. I have heard criticism, particularly from designers of the old days who say like the, the, the spell on a stick is kind of boring. The idea that you get a sword and the sword has some spell attached seems really unique and novel, but really that's, that's, that's boring design work and you should, be, you should be better at designing stuff. And I disagree, particularly because we're not designing professional. I think that's true for professional magic items or if you're publishing in a book, that'd be one thing. But I think like when you're making magic items for the characters at your table, the idea of combining spell effects with magic items is super super powerful super interesting very exciting for players really lets players expand out in, in their characters in the areas that they might not be able to get to and it's very easy to do it's one of my favorite tricks for treasure it might be the favorite trick i have for treasure is adding an interesting effect an interesting spell effect to a magic item give it one use per day and Baldur's gate 3 does this all over the place you get first of all you just get riddled with magic items in Baldur's gate 3 you get tons of them, which probably tells you you don't have to be too stingy with magic items in 5e, particularly because Baldur's Gate 3 does not have an attunement mechanic, and 5e does. So you know you don't have to worry too much about giving out too many magic items because the attunement slots keep things in check. You can also make sure that any item that's going to have a big effect requires an attunement slot. That really, that really helps. But having lots of items with different effects on them is really interesting. Another element that I hadn't considered that I got from Baldur's Gate 3 that I think can work really, really well are augments to spell effects or augments to particular powers that you they can make them small so an example is there's an item that lets you cast one extra magic missile whenever you cast magic missile very minor item right but if you have this one particular item it just boosts one spell the trick that we have is we can design these around the spells we know our players like or we can balance them around spells that we think our characters might enjoy but aren't quite as powerful as they they are an example would be like true strike Right, True Strike as a spell is not a very good spell as it's written in 2014 D&D, but if you put it like on a weapon and you say once per day, you can cast a spell True Strike as a bonus action. Or maybe you say you can cast True Strike as a bonus action, period. As long as you have this weapon. That means whenever they don't have a good use for their bonus action, they can use it to get advantage on their next attack. That's pretty powerful. So you took that spell and just changed it slightly so now it uses a bonus action instead of a regular action. So that idea of not just adding a spell effect, but augmenting certain spell effects. What if like any fire-based spell does an extra D6 fire damage? That's really cool. That, that sort of tunes a character around a particular build. Now all of a sudden, all of their spells that use fire get to be more powerful. So that's a neat idea that you see and many magic items of Baldur's Gate 3 that you can directly apply to that you can directly apply to magic items in your own game. 
potions as bonus actions is a very common house rule. I played in a game a campaign recently where the DM had us use, gave us the ability to use potions as a bonus action. And I had been against it because I thought like, oh, it's going to make potion use too easy. Well, there's an interesting thing I learned about bonus actions that I learned before I started playing Baldur's Gate 3, but then Baldur's Gate 3 kind of showed me that it's true, which is bonus actions are just actions. It's just basically another particular type of action you get on your turn. It's not lesser than a standard action. It's not lesser than a normal action. It just does different things. And many times characters already have really good options for bonus actions. The more powerful the character is, the more options for bonus actions they have. And so that means they have to balance what they're going to use their bonus action for. So if you move potions to a bonus action and remove it from an action, that actually doesn't really change the limitations that they have. They're still limited in the number of potions they can drink or when they can drink or having to switch something else out. It just changes the class of the action type from, from normal to bonus. It also hinders them the other way, which means you can't use it as a normal action and sometimes they want to use it as a normal action. So seeing this in play in Baldur's Gate 3 showed me that having potions drinkable as a bonus action gives a slight edge to characters so that they can they can drink stuff when they want to and still can do a normal action but it doesn't really overbalance the game like I thought it would because it turns out there are so many other actions you would want to take with your bonus action that you can't take because you want to drink a potion so if you wanted to add the drink potions as a bonus action rule to your game you're not going to break anything in fact lots of people have used this house rule before and it works really well so that's kind of a fun house rule. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to try it in a game or not because it didn't really offer that much of an advantage in the game where I played it that way. We thought it would, but it really didn't. I don't really know that it's a big, a really necessary handling resources and supply. There really isn't an effect for this in our in vanilla 2014 D&D. We don't worry about rations so much. You don't worry about having supply. It is something I have seen in Level Up Advanced 5e, and it's something that we see in Baldur's Gate 3. The idea that if you want to rest, you have to have enough supplies to be able to rest. Now, supplies can come from picking up apples and oranges. There's a really funny dialogue at one point in the game where somebody says, yeah, this one time we basically camped for three days eating nothing but pears or, you know, or butter rolls. It was pretty funny. And... I don't think you need to do it to the level of, of the, 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 the atomic level that Baldur's Gate 3 does, but I really kind of dig the idea of level up advanced 5e's supply mechanic. And the supply mechanic is something that you can pretty much pluck right out of advanced 5e, level up advanced 5e by Eon World Publishing, and drop straight into your 5e game if you want to manage rests a little more. The way it works is that in order for you to rest, you need two things. You need a safe haven, a place that you can rest comfortably and you're pretty not, you're not worried about getting shot in the face by anger. Yorks and you have one supply per character for that day to be able to eat you can carry as many supplies as your strength score so you, you it's and it, it's separate from the rest of your inventory so you don't have to worry about the weight of your supply but you have a certain number of supply that's equal to your strength score that's how many you can carry it costs a certain amount of money to buy and that is another resource that you can attack as a GM. You're going through a swamp. They're failing checks left and right. You lose two supply. Everybody loses two supply. Oh my God, we don't have as much food. When you run out of supply, you can't rest and get your, your stuff back. So supply is something that you can constantly be bringing in and pushing out. It's very simple. And what you notice from Baldur's Gate 3 is in Baldur's Gate 3, you almost never run out of supply. I've never run out, but it, you, it, because you know it is a limited resource, it just hinders you enough from just resting all the time. And instead, you really only rest after the major times where you're like, okay, I know I'm going to go into this. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and take a full rest. But you know it's not unlimited. Uh, at the end of the game, you can buy pretty much unlimited supply. But it still costs you money, and you know that your money is is not infinite either. So while you're never likely to run out, adding an element of supply to the game is definitely something that gets players just aware enough to not decide to camp all the time and everywhere. And I think that idea of safe havens and supply from Level Up Advanced 5e, and maybe we're going to do another deeper look into this in a future video, but uh, looking at uh, your supply and looking at your... Uh, resources and safe havens is a great way to uh, change how long rests work in 5e makes it a little harder to do and means that the players are more conscious of not just resting after every battle.
So those are just a few of the tips that I've picked up from my playthrough of Baldur's Gate 3. I'm really interested to hear what other elements of Baldur's Gate 3 you might have found that you think change how you look at tabletop role-playing games. Fascinating game, and it's fascinating to watch the overlap of both this super popular video game and this hobby that we all love. Let's look at some questions from the 2024 Patreon Q&A. Every month on the Sly Flourish Patreon, I put up a new Q&A thread. Patrons can ask any TTRPG-related question that they want to. On Friday mornings, I get my coffee and I sit down and I enjoy reading through the questions and answering them. Some of those questions make their way to the show here. Other ones becomes catalysts for other videos or articles that I write elsewhere. Cloaker, a Patreon of Sly Flourish, was actually the one who asked if I've played Baldur's Gate 3 and what design elements regarding its unique interpretation. The video or the, the segment I just did is based on that particular question. So thank you, Cloaker, for that outstanding question about Baldur's Gate 3. I hope you found that segment useful. Matthew D says, White Room Reddit theorists will tell you there is a massive car- caster and marshal divide in 5e, being that casters have many options and can shape worlds and marshals hit things. Do you believe this is the case? If so, do you have any anything to lessen the gap? It's actually interesting. We just had a patron of Sly Flourish come onto the Patreon, the, the, the Patreon Discord server and say the exact opposite. Fighters have a, this huge advantage over marshal casters because they can spike so much damage and they don't have to rest and stuff like that. I don't really believe i i don't want to say i don't believe it's true i mean you feel how you feel people feel how they feel i don't feel like there is a big divide between casters and martial characters one way or the other i think they do very different things they have a very different effect on the game itself and they're effective at different parts of the games and again you can kind of see this in baldur's gate 3 if i'm going to pick up baldur's gate 3 again in baldur's gate 3 you can i have martial characters that are just dominating the battlefield so in battle i think marshals are actually stronger than casters are casters can kind of do more stuff but that's kind of part of that balance and of course balance is a tricky thing there really isn't balance to me the big question is are there are am i seeing players who are directly avoiding certain classes and instead favoring other classes and the answer is no i'm really not that i i see players playing all different kinds of characters of all different classes and subclasses and they always are interested in trying new things they will definitely find that certain builds are more effective at certain things than others but they my players have always been enjoying the characters that they have and rarely have i seen somebody completely respec a character to a whole different class or something like that so there are times where you're like yeah i i used to have this one character that did all this amazing stuff and now my new character isn't doing the same amazing stuff but you can usually find something that that character is really good at so I don't think I don't I don't really believe in the caster versus marshal thing. I think I really feel like people just kind of grab onto and they're they're trying to find another slice and another tribe to belong to that then lets them yell at the other tribes within the larger hobby that i might be overly harsh on that and you know we've seen some 2024 differences and we're seeing some of the other rpgs for example level up advanced 5e has a whole ton of new options for melee character classes that are as rich and as vibrant as what spellcasters have for spells so this is another one where other 5e publishers can solve a lot of these problems and probably have solved a lot of these problems if you're willing to bring in the material from those other those other systems another trick is if you do feel like one group or the other is sort of lagging behind the rest you can give them tailored magic items that boost the thing that they're good at that make them continue to shine in a different way than what other characters do so that's that's another way that you can kind of kind of tune things but i'm not a real big believer in it but i do i think if you believe that this exists there's almost certainly other publishers who've been publishing material that you could check out that can help fix that problem duncan c says i have a recurring problem i enjoy running one shots sometimes to introduce new players try new systems test out new books or just because i find an interesting scenario almost always however these one shots end up being more like a two or three shot at a minimum minimum i recently ran lightless beacon to introduce my players to call of cthulhu it was advertised as a one hour scenario we managed to finish it in one sitting although it took about five hours not including character creation we only used about half the written scenario although we reached a proper conclusion any tips for running short shorter one shots especially for new players or new systems so there's a few things you can do one is don't run it as a one shot say that it might take a couple of sessions and and ask people if they're willing to enjoy a couple of sessions particularly if you're trying a whole new uh, a whole new system that 
it, it, because it takes time for people to understand what the system and how it works and everything like that and lots of conversations that you might need more time and if you have the opportunity to have two sessions if it's the same players they're willing to come back and do it again split it out into multiple sessions let it take as long as it needs to you could still have it be short but you could let it take as long as it needs to and not worry about trying to hammer everything into a small session game if you really feel like you have to fit it in one session though I don't know if it works for games like Call of Cthulhu but it might work for others which is you got to look at the middle of the game and say what can I cut from the middle to get to the end this is something I've definitely seen with like Adventures League games and other sort of four hour games that are designed to fit in four hours just barely fit and sometimes don't instead of cutting the end of the game no you know set yourself a timer and know that okay an hour before the end of the session they better be at the end the the final scene because it could take an hour and that means that a half hour before that they better be on their way so you can give yourself sort of an hour and a half warning and say, okay, whatever they're doing at the hour and a half mark, they're wrapping up and then I'm moving them forward to the end because that's where it needs to go. And a lot of time that means just cutting scenes out of the middle of the game that are boring. You need a strong start and you need a strong ending. You almost don't need anything else. So look hard at what's going on in the middle of the game. Figure out how to connect your start to the end so that you can get right to the ending when you need to get there that can work too another issue is the how many players you have more players it's going to take longer so if, if you have fewer players you can usually get through a lot more material and depending on the kind of game and the kind of system you're running run low level games don't try to run really advanced games with higher level characters because they have too many options they take too much time and your players are not going to be used to those high level options and they're going to have a lot of stuff so but that's really for like 5e games it, it's really going to de depend on your system but mostly if you have to fit it into one session i would take a really hard look at the middle during your prep and say if i only had the start and end scene what would i drop in there to get them from point a to point b and skip everything else in the middle be ready to skip it and then you can add that stuff in if you have the time and if things are moving along but that moment of like an hour and a half before the end be ready to move to the ending and you you should be at the final big scene with an hour to spare because a lot of and, you know maybe you know god help you if it takes longer than an hour but that, you know, that gives you that should give you enough time to have a firm conclusion, because I'll tell you, it ruins a game. If you run the boring middle and you get to the end, you're like, sorry, we have to end the game before the end of the game. That's so lame. It's like the film breaking at the end of the game. It's just terrible. So those are my thoughts, Duncan. Thank you for the question. Rasmus L says, I've been been first time DMing for four sessions now and really like most of your advice. I like the qualifier. I might have bitten off more a bit much with my first homebrew nautical campaign. My group just acquired a ship and made 12 plus NPCs for them to bring along as the crew and fill out proficiencies that the group lacked, each with different personalities, backgrounds, motivations. My idea were that they could sort of be a sort of side quest hub for my group when traveling around my archipelago and whatnot. My issue is now, how do I make my job easier and lazier for running a large ensemble cast of recurring NPCs that feel alive and and my players can engage with. There's a few things you can do. One is you, you, having like a, a, some notes, either, you know, however you keep track of your notes and having little, like a little dossier on each of the NPCs that you can kind of go through and review during your notes. And instead of worrying about all 12, pick a handful of them. First of all, you might immediately split the group into two and say, these six we're not going to worry about right they, they're still on the crew they're still doing stuff these six we are going to worry about and these six are going to be the ones where i'm going to pay more attention to them session to session and what they're doing what's going on you can also choose those six by saying which ones have the characters resonated with which ones have good strong character connections which one did the players seem to really like and focus on that that's really neat like you're actually in a good place to have 12 and then see which one the players are like oh i want to talk to that cook i really liked him like okay cook is now one of the npcs and then which ones do they not talk to they just sort of fade off into the background and do their own thing and that way you can sort of focus them. Stephen King actually had this problem in the book, The Stand. He had written The Stand and it's this huge book, 1200 page book or something like that. I just reread it recently. And he, at one point in the middle of the book, he has like 15 main characters or something. He has some tremendous amount of main characters. And I remember he, he wrote in on writing that he was at this place where he's like, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with so many characters. And he's like, and he blew him up and killed half the characters. So all of a sudden, and he reduced it down to like four, right? And he took all of like halfway. And then there was this huge shock in the middle of the book where like half the characters die. And then you have four main characters and those four characters go on this the, the, the quest that covers the rest of the book. So you could always have some of those 12 depart right maybe and, and they're kind of characters that the characters are that the npcs the characters are connected to that might be a really strong thing don't don't fridge people on purpose but that could be a really good way of of making a big impact is if the ship 
gets attacked, maybe they lose some of the crew. And you could even roll randomly. I did this in my in my Spelljammer game. I was very clear to the players that a war is going to go on and people are going to die. And I said, we're going to roll randomly to see who it, who, it, who who lives and who dies. And we did. And I think they actually managed to help everybody survive. Or I think only one person died. But it was really interesting. And that they them knowing that that was the case, that it wasn't you picking on them. It wasn't you doing things just to be shocked, just for shock value, that you were actually like determining which ones lived and which ones died was really interesting. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of what you can do with your giant pile of NPCs. Peanut says, I've recently started a new campaign with my group using the Taldorai Reborn book as my setting guide. The sessions I have run have mostly been modules altered to fit the lore of Taldorai. I'm using your fantastic adventures and other anthology books like Yawning Portal and Where Evil Lives. Me and my players have been enjoying this a lot. One thing I want to try is running self-made adventures in this setting, inspired by your advice on how to homebrew adventures in published settings. Now I have lots of DM resources and random tables, monster books, etc., but I find it very hard to confidently put together an adventure for a session that seems as good as published material. Published material has got a lot of hours put into it, art, maps, complex stories, etc., and I'm left wondering if I could make anything close to that good while preparing my own game in a reasonable time frame. Do you have any advice for designing and preparing specifically homebrew adventures? Yes, don't compare them to published ones is my first advice that when you look at what goes into a published adventure, they have tons of resources, playtesting, design, editing, all this other stuff that you don't have, but you have something they don't, which is, you know, yourself and you know, your world and you know, your, your campaign and you know, your players and no writer of an adventure has those things. They don't know what it's like for you. And that advantage is huge. That means that even though you don't have these, uh, all the fancy stuff that you get with a published adventure, you have direct knowledge of what you need at the moment. And the notes and the design of your adventure should not match the design of what a published adventure does. I think this is a common problem and a common thought and a common mistake. Your notes can be very brief with just the material you need written as scratchy and as poorly as you want to help you run the adventure because you're when you think about what goes into writing an adventure i'm not there to write an adventure for myself i'm there to write an adventure for a published adventure for you to use at your game which means i'm trying to design it for you to help you run your game you don't need to do that for anybody else other than you you're not trying to write it for anybody else you're not trying to make sure that it's pretty and you can publish it on the dms guild you're writing it for yourself and your players which means you get to focus on just the things that matter this is why i think return of the lazy dungeon master resonates with people is it's the first time that they're really told hey your notes can be like one page they don't need to be fancy they don't need to be beautiful you don't need to take a picture and put them up on instagram this is your notes for you to run your game you don't need to have anything more than maybe the name of the npc because you in your head you remember everything else about them. You don't need to have, you can abbreviate stuff left and right. You don't have to write read aloud text because you don't have to read it. You can just write the three things that will remind you what's in the room so that you can speak to it. And that I think is a real key that if you, if you look at your notes, recall that they do not need to match published adventures. And it's a very common thing that I don't think new DMs get to hear enough. My understanding is the new 2024 D&D Dungeon Master's Guide is going to have notes like this. It's going to show you what notes are like for a campaign that you're building yourself. And I think that could be very valuable. But you can look at the examples in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master as well of the kinds of things that are there that are intended to help you remember what you need and improvise the game that you can run at the table. So yeah, don't the, the big, the big number one thing is do not try to compare your stuff with published stuff. Now where you get a real value, here's a real trick though. You can steal all the stuff from those published adventures and just rewrite the adventure around them. So you can use maps and rewrite the room descriptions. You can take NPC art and change the NPC name. You can take all of the expensive part of those published adventures and strip them down and and use them with your own material for your game, for your story, for your campaign, for your players. And that's a really powerful thing to do. And you can do that at any degree down from, I'm just going to take one picture from one piece of art that I like all the way through all, you know, that you're going to run most of the adventure the way it is, but you're going to strip out all the NPCs and change them with NPCs that matter to the characters. So that's where like published material really offers a lot of value is that it includes a lot of that very expensive stuff that you can't make. You can't get Mike Schley to make a map for you, right? It would cost you a ton. You can't get the art director and all of the artists that have ever done 
all of the artwork for Descent into Avernus. But if you're running an adventure in hell and you don't even need to follow anything else in the book, but you can use all the artwork from Descent into Avernus and all the maps and then rewrite them around what you want to write. And it's a really powerful thing to do. So that way you can get the benefit of all of the time that went into those published adventures, but you get to write it around your own. That I think is a tremendous value. Really, really powerful stuff. So Peanut, I hope that helped you. That was an outstanding question. Mark says, I was listening to your readings and reflections podcast, by the way, if you're not aware what he's talking about, hero tier subscribers to Patreon get access to another weekly podcast called Readings and Reflections. In Readings and Reflections, I talk about a Sly Flourish article. I read the article out and then we discuss that article in a short 10 to 12 minute long weekly podcast. It's really fun to do. It's published every Thursday and hero tier subscribers get access every week and, and access to the entire archive of previous Readings and Reflections. It's one of the many benefits that you get for being a patron of Sly Flourish. Mark, thank you so much for giving me that opportunity to pitch the Patreon again. I was listening to your Readings and Reflections podcast centered around your Bathe Your World in Lore article. I really enjoyed it, and I found your words quite encouraging as a relatively new DM who was drawn to TTRPGs by the prospect of building wondrous worlds. I've been working in my own campaign setting for a while now, mostly as a passion project, but someday as something I will share with my players and other DMs. As I was listening to your podcast, I found myself wondering what you think about Wolfgang Bauer's essay in the Kobold Guide to World Building Volume one titled what is setting design while i think you believe a world builder should freely build the lore around their world my takeaway from wolfgang's essay was that he believes world builders should keep the lore to a minimum to maintain dm agency in using the setting for their campaign i can see the issues in over and under baking the world of the uh, the lore of the worlds we create but i'm interested in one your view on wolfgang's essay and two how you have struck the balance when writing the city of arches source book another product man you were just helping me plug the patreon over and over again yes uh wolfgang bauer so so cobalt press publishes these cobalt guides to various things cobalt guide to monsters cobalt guide to world building and so on i've been very lucky to write essays for a number of these books and they offer really really cool stuff so i did go back and read what is setting design by wolfgang bauer and you know a lot of it is like well there's what you want and what you think can help i really think it's one thing for you to write a campaign world for yourself and your group and something else to write one for somebody else in the same way that the previous question talked about where I talked about the difference between a published adventure and an adventure that you write for yourself. It's something very much to keep in mind, which is how that the, the real story that's going on is the story of the characters. They are the main characters and the things they do are what is going to matter. And when you're writing a setting book or you, or you're writing an adventure, I think you want to be building a place that's ripe for building situations that the characters can get involved in to make that story. You're not writing the story. And it's really easy to get wrapped up in our own lore, which end up being stories. And then the stories tend to matter more than what the characters do. And um, an element that you, we've seen in this over the years in TTRPGs are when there are these known main characters in the stories that we tell. And an example would be like El Minister from Forgotten Realms right that here's this super powerful wizard that goes wrong he's first of all he's totally like gandalf and you know goes around and does this stuff and he's going on adventures and he's making things but when you look at like the history of the forgotten realms and they've had these major events that aren't just history in many cases they were contemporary and the contemporary stories eclipsed the things that the players were doing and that got to be lame so way back in like the 80s they had an event for forgotten realms called the time of troubles and this is when all of the gods came down to the forgotten realms and had big battles with each other and some of them died and some of them didn't and it resulted in a lot of stuff and i remember reading the books at the time and i was like this is lame because i don't want to have this stuff going on while my players are off doing their own adventures i want my players to be doing this stuff now that has become history now that's a hundred years ago when the time of troubles occurred so now that kind of lore is in the background but at the time when you have a bunch of like big situations going on particularly if you have big important npcs i would avoid having big important npcs the npcs should be support cast all of them should be support cast there should not be any main characters that aren't the characters of the game and that's something that when you're designing your setting you want to be careful of don't focus it around 
char- main characters that aren't your main characters. Make sure they all are support characters to the characters that are going on. And all of that has been something that I keep in mind when I've been writing City of Arches. And I just went through this big revision. And it was like making sure like everything is there for characters to get involved in adventures. That it's the whole thing is designed for characters to get involved in adventures. Whether it's talking to people, whether it's delving into dungeons, whether it's, you know, battling things. Everything is there. There isn't, you know, the history that has occurred happened long ago. And there are new things that could happen that are all situations that the characters can get involved in. And that's really what the campaign is written about. So Mark, I hope that helps answer your question. Friends, I want to thank all of you for hanging out with me today while we talked about all things in tabletop role-playing games. If you enjoyed this show and you want to see more stuff like this, please consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. It is absolutely free to sign up. You get a free adventure generator for signing up and you get a weekly RPG-related newsletter sent directly to your inbox every Tuesday. You can also support me directly on Patreon. Patrons get access to the City of Arches source book. The, if you join at the Hero Tier, you get the Readings and Reflections podcast. You get a bunch of tools to help you run your games. You get a bunch of other books to help you run your games a bunch of adventures tons of stuff that you get for being a patron of Flash, and access to the q a and access to the discord server and you can pick up any of my books including forge of foes return of the lazy dungeon master lazy dm's companion all of the fantastic books and more at the sly flourish bookstore thank you all so much have a great day and get out there and play an rpg